Hey guys, what's going on? It is Michael from The Honest Youth Pastor. And I want to thank you for checking out this video on eldership. My prayer in prayer pairing this is that uh, it would be incredibly helpful to you, maybe clarifying. Maybe you've never even thought of the subject before. Or maybe you've thought about going into, into ministry and you didn't know there were qualifications for that. So ho hopefully, regardless of where you're coming from, this will be helpful to you. Uh, maybe it'll just, you know, you've already know these things and it'll just bring them more forward in your mind. Or maybe you disagree and it'll push you to maybe, uh, you know, look into why you believe what you believe about eldership and pastors. Um, a lot of this research uh, has been made available. I've been able to have the time to do this research because of our partners at over at odgapparel.com. So make sure you go check them out. Uh, and if you do get anything over there, I got stuff over there. They've got their own stuff. Just make sure you use the discount code honest 10 and you'll get 10% off of all of your, your total order. So check that out. Um, with that being said, I want to let you know that there is no way that I'm going to be able to cover the totality of this enormous topic in this video. My hope is to give you an overarching view of eldership in scripture. And then down in the description, you're going to find a ton of uh, resources as far as uh, articles, videos, books, things that I would encourage you to check out uh, because this is a massive topic. There's no way that in this short video, uh, we're going to be able to go over all of it. But I wanna go over the kind of the overarching principles and then give you the tools to be able to go explore that yourself because this is a huge topic. So the first thing we need to start on is why do we even need to have this conversation, all right? Well, we need to have this conversation for a few reasons. One, many churches have lost the core of what elder, pastor, bishop means. I mean, many people, depending on your denomination, and we'll talk about that here in a minute, would even question me putting elder, pastor, bishop, overseer in the same category. Like they think those are different things. So that right there, we might be starting off on a little bit of a different footing, but hopefully we can kind of find some commonality here. The point is that many churches have lost it and it's become sort of this overarching definition of just generic leadership. So you're going to find in the description all of those resources I just talked about. Many of them lead, uh, lean one way doctrinally because um, depending on, and we're talking specifically within Protestantism here, but within the wider evangelical church, in some sectors of it, um, it's just become, eldership has become like this generic term of leadership. There's some pastors that don't really differentiate between leaders and elders. Uh, they just don't. So they'll, when they talk about leadership, it's this very generic kind of cultural leadership. This is what it means to be a good leader. This is what it looks to build a good team. Uh, but they don't make the, the distinction that we see in scripture between eldership, deacon, and uh, the wider church body. They just don't make that. So the reason I think it's important to talk about this is because there is a difference. Like, when you talk about leadership, there's a difference between leadership within the world and leadership within the church. And I think we see a, a good reason for that within scripture. Now, if we don't have a clear biblical definition or distinction, there can quickly become like this shift of power uh, and focus from scripture onto a person. And you've probably seen this before, right? So a general picture of this is the church that is driven by personality and not scripture, right? So I've heard it said before, if pastor so-and-so isn't talking or speaking or preaching this Sunday, then I, I, don't, I don't really care to listen. And this is, this is seen by the statistics that we can actually look at, right? So if you look at like big name churches on, on at any you know, little tradition within the evangelical church, you'll see that if the lead pastor, the main pastor isn't speaking that Sunday, those video views or those podcast downloads actually drop significantly because what's unfortunately happened within the church is we have this idea that there is the one and only pastor and uh, if that person isn't speaking or if that person isn't, you know, uh, you're preaching on a passage, then we're not interested in listening to what the other elder of that church says. Um, so that's an, an important distinction. I found that, especially in my early walk with Christ, that was something that I fell into. If somebody wasn't talking, like, so just to give a great example, I know in college that uh, I was really into listening to Matt Chandler, like he and a couple other, like I had four people. And if Matt Chandler wasn't speaking a particular Sunday at the village, I just, I wouldn't listen. Like, I just like, oh, who cares about this other guy? So we, we fall into that a lot, right? If somebody isn't teaching, we just don't listen. Now, again, sometimes the other elders, maybe not, they might not be as strong as communicators, but the point is 
that without a biblical definition of what elder is, we fall into like a personality driven mentality and not the, the category of elder, right? Of being able to teach. So uh, a misunderstanding or undervaluing of eldership leads to poor decision making. Uh, what I mean by that is churches will just fill a spot to fill a spot, right? So if, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, but if churches don't have a you know, a, an elder body, a plurality of elders, uh, you just have one main pastor. If that pastor leaves uh, for whatever reason, right, dies off, goes to another church, quits, gets disqualified, whichever the category is, and that church is left with nobody there, then there's this, um, there's this problem, right? Because now who fills that spot? There's like this panic to fill it, especially if it was, if it's vacated like really quickly. So who do we put there? I've actually seen churches that, um, that, that are more elder board, like more board ran than elder ran. And uh, because of, uh, I, of how I, I speak, I go to different churches and speak at different churches. And a lot of just because of I've made it pretty well known within the people that know that I am willing to fill in or willing to speak at places that, hey, it doesn't matter who or where church, whatever it is, just if they can't find anybody, I will, I'll do it. There's, I'll, I'll go preach the gospel anywhere. And um, I've been to a number of churches, one specifically, that literally had a sign-up sheet on the back of uh, the church uh, in the vestibule that said, hey, if you want to be an elder, go ahead and sign your name to the sheet uh, because they couldn't get anybody to do it. And so the, the point of that is when we undervalue that, uh, we'll give anybody the spot, whether they're qualified or not. We'll, like, we'll just panic fill. So we have to have this understanding of the necessity and the importance of what elders are and the qualifications of it. Because if not, you'll put anybody in there. And that is incredibly dangerous. Now, uh, a lot of this is driven by your understanding of how, how church works, right? Uh, it, it's driven by your, your, how churches are set up. Uh, for example, how churches uh, operate. Who, who's supposed to operate where? What, you know, what are their duties? How are they supposed to do this? And we'll talk about this more in church structure, uh, but when, when you don't understand that, <laughs> then a lot, of, a lot of bad things can happen. Uh, what, we, uh, what you need to know is that your denomination or your upbringing uh, likely influenced your view of how the church operates uh, far more than scripture actually uh, did, right? So you'll grow up with this idea of who can be the pastor, how many pastors you have, what their ideas are, how they you know, who votes on what, who decides, make the decisions, all of that uh, is more, more so than not always driven by your tradition and not necessarily how the Bible sets it up. So when we understand church structure based on tradition rather than scripture, like we can come off with a lot of like really wonky ideas. Now, we're going to talk about church structure later, and it's not that any of them are the way. Uh, we all land in kind of our areas of what we think is better, and I'll make my my opinion is known on that as well. But the idea is that we, we really have to, and we should look to what the scriptures say, at least the bare bones of it, and then apply that. Because there's some structures that are set up that don't seem like they do that at all. And I think you can run into a lot of trouble that way. So let's get right into it then. So what is biblical eldership? So if eldership is so important, if it's this big topic, if it's this really important thing to understand, well, what is eldership then? Well, there's there's main texts that kind of go over it. They're known as generally as the pastoral epistles, though some would argue as far as that would be the, the purpose of them. But uh, the text that we always look to for this primarily is 1 Timothy chapter 3 verses 1 through 7 and Titus chapter 1 verses 5 through 9. Uh, and you might be like, well, that's those are only a couple of verses to base your entire church structure on. Well, we see this in the wider body as well, uh, wider scriptures as well, as far as kind of uh, seeing that the indications of this is how uh, the church was set up uh, throughout, you know, the early church as far as when they started to form their structure. Uh, but th there's a list of qualifications, right, that we find from not only these two sections of scripture, but kind of the supporting scriptures that we see throughout uh, as well. And we'll get to those in a minute. But the qualifications are this, right? So let's read them. Uh, the elder is to be above reproach, a husband of one wife, self-controlled, sober-minded, orderly, hospitable, able to teach and defend the scriptures, not a drunkard, not violent, not greedy for wealth, manages his home well with dignity, not a recent convert, well thought of outside the church, not arrogant, lover of good, 
upright, holy, attentive to the flock, willing to lead, and is a good example to the congregation. Um, now there's some supporting text for this that kind of that bear into this, which is Acts chapter 20 verses 28 through 31, James chapter 5 verse 14, and 1 Peter chapter 5 verses 1 through 4. Also uh, support this and build into this as well as far as shepherding the flock, what that shepherd's supposed to do, that sort of thing. Uh, the idea here is that these are the qualifications, like this is uh, the the bar. Uh, for what it should look like. Now, there's some people, and we'll get into this a little bit more in detail in a minute, that would say, well, shouldn't every Christian kind of, you know, in general fit this? Well, yeah, there should. There's a few things that are unique to this list, though, as far as for elders that wouldn't apply to every believer. So able to teach, for example, uh, uh, the scriptures, able to shepherd the flock, for example, is another one. Uh, Husband of one wife, and we'll get into a lot of that murkiness here in a minute. Uh, and attentive to the flock. Those sort of things are specific uh, to uh, the elder, so uh, what the elder should look like. So these qualifications have led some to the argument that the qualifications are either too restrictive uh, in both kind as well as gender roles, right? And we'll dig into a little bit of that in a minute. But some of the things that I've heard uh, from people like that I've had discussions about eldership with uh, one of the sentences is it's difficult to find men that fit these requirements. Now we'll go into more detail on that in a minute, but if that's like the objection for why you shouldn't follow these qualifications, like you have bigger problems on your hand than, than eldership. Um, well, actually it ties into eldership, I guess. Uh, the second thing is I can hardly get people to volunteer, let alone be elders requiring qualifications, make this process much more difficult. Uh, once again, that ties into the idea that there, there's underlying problems here. Like, so if you don't have men that are qualified for eldership based on the qualifications we find in scripture, there are, um, there are underlying issues there that need to be looked into. Some course correction probably needs to be made as far as the teaching of the church. Um, but we'll get into that. But those two things there are like, Ugh, if you can't find anybody that meets these, nobody wants to serve in the church. Like th- there's bigger issues here than just, um, than what you you think are there. Uh, then there's questions of like, can single men be elders, pastors? Uh, the question isn't here, but can divorced men be pastors? We're going to get into both those in a minute, as well as why not have women in these elder roles as well. So the last two are probably the most uh, controversial, contentious, and we'll approach those uh, with a lot as, as a lot of grace. So. The, the first thing is finding qualified men, right? So if your question is, I can't find qualified men to fit these roles, um, then we have some signs that you need to get a little bit back to more basic preaching, teaching, right? So if you can't find men that fit the roles as far as not greedy, uh, they're not able to teach, they can't defend the gospel, they're not good examples to the flock, they're not thought of well outside of the church. I mean, that's just some of them, right? If you can't find men that fit those qualifications, then we need to do a lot better job. Like whoever is in leadership right, needs to not be like, well, we'll just put a sign up sheep in the back of the church. Uh, I still can't believe that's a real story, but it is. I'm sure there's more horror stories you guys have, but um, that's not the answer. The answer isn't it. We'll just lower the bar temporarily. That's, that's a horrible idea um, because once the bar is lowered, then it's going to be a whole lot harder to get that back where it needs to be. Instead of lowering the bar, the idea is that I'm whoever is in leadership is going to work. And I'm not like, let me make this clear. This is not an easy process to do. This is this may even requirement require uh, work from people outside of the church. Right. So oftentimes when we look at Timothy and Titus, they were both left there for the reason uh, reason of raising up elders with the idea that they're not going to stay there forever, but they need to raise up men that will stay there forever. So this may require, if, you, if your church is in a place where you have men in position that could be moved into eldership, uh, it may require outside help, people coming in that do meet those requirements, coming in and uh, teaching, living, doing those sorts of things to set that example to raise men up. Like this isn't easy. Like I, I, I think that needs to be said. Like this isn't an overnight magic bullet sort of we can you know we'll take care of all the situation like this this might take some time to do so so that we understand like oh this this is important um 
you need to get back to the basics. Uh, the idea of just throwing somebody in and be like, we'll see if they make it. Like trial by fire situation is a horrible, a horrible way to do this. The idea and the principles we see in scripture biblically is that these men are already qualified to be elders. It's not that you put them in the position and then they learn to be qualified, right? Uh, going back to the, God doesn't uh, call the qualified, he qualifies the called. Well, yes and no. The idea is that these men, before they're put into el eldership, will meet those qualifications. They don't be, they don't learn those qualifications while they're elders. They meet those qualifications before they become elders. Uh, finding qualified elders helps in the long run. And here, here's why. And I want to touch on this, but I don't want to spend a lot of time on this. When you have a plurality of elders, which I'm going to contend is what we see scripturally. I think it's the best method that uh, churches can operate in. When you have a plurality of elders, it helps bring accountability to ministry. Okay. Um, it helps prevent uh, and deal with issues of abuse, whether they be physical or, or otherwise. Um, it, it helps with uh, money management, financial problems. It helps with, uh, uh, you know, abuses of power. Like when you have a plurality of elders, it even helps with abuse of teaching, right? Teaching incorrectly, because um, when you have a plurality of elders, these people are held accountable to one another and to the congregation. So if I, if I fit the qualifications of elder, for example, and I am in that position, and this other person has at one point also fit the qualifications of elder is in that position. Uh, we are at that point, I shouldn't have to worry about their financial ability to take care of finances. I shouldn't have to worry about them being above reproach. I shouldn't have to worry about, you know, them teaching correctly. But the truth is we're all sinners, all in need of grace all the time. Um, so there is a possibility that they are going to fall in one of those areas, though, ideally, again, elders are not perfect people, but they are people that are, have been sanctified and have been proven to be trustworthy. So when they're in that position, not that they're outside of temptation, but the idea is that they are surrounded by other men that have also met those qualifications that can walk through them, spot those warning signs before things happen, and then correct, course correct far before there's a problem that needs course corrected from. Does that make sense? So when you have qualified elders, in the long run, it helps things out, right? So it helps with the idea that, you know, a pastor misused finances or a pastor was caught in some sort of relationship emotionally or physically that they shouldn't have been in. It helps with doctrinal teaching, right? Because you have other elders around you that know you and then most importantly are from different backgrounds as well. A plurality of elders helps because uh, it's, it's very likely that Elder A and Elder B do not have the same background, right? So maybe one of them was an atheist and Christ drew them in. Maybe one of them grew up in church and so they've grown up in that structure. Maybe one of them is from a very wealthy family and another one is from a not so wealthy family, right? So when you have the diversity within your plurality, it helps not only with keeping things accountable, but it also helps with the diversity within the ranks of elders so that now that when we're teaching and preaching, now that when we're dealing with finances, now that when we're dealing with, you know, outreach and ministry and evangelism and missions, like all of these things, uh, because there's a plurality of eldership uh, that is qualified, we now have a much better leadership team that can address all of the issues that maybe one person isn't going to see. So if I'm an elder by myself, pastoring a church, uh, and I come from one background, I'm not going to see certain things that other guys are going to see. Um, but because I can, because I love them and I trust them and I, I know uh, that they're qualified as well, then they can speak into these situations in a biblical manner and we can hold each other account for these things. So I just want to press in really hard on this topic. Having qualified elders in the long run, right? Not just not just trial by fire, not just shooting somebody in the position, but actually putting in a structure in which elders are brought up within the church and placed within the church. It's incredibly important because in the long run, it protects Christ's church from scandal and from like, you know, just being talked bad about because these elders are now in positions in which they've been tested. They're they're They have been shown to fit these qualifications. And now they hold each other accountable as well as the congregation also doing that if necessary. Um, but in an ideal situation, the congregation won't have to do that because the eldership is doing that uh, amongst themselves. Now, 
with that being saying said, I know we don't live in, you know, a perfect world where that happens all the time. So the, the great thing is that the congregation is there. The deacons are there. We'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, the deacons and the congregation are there in order to also hold the eldership at account because now the eldership has to meet the qualifications that are laid forth in scripture. So they can't just be a rule in and of themselves changing the rules. The rules are defined by scripture. So now if an elder can be proven to fall outside of these qualifications, and there's also scripture, for example, to bring in a, bring in a, a, an accusation against an elder, for example, there's, there's a whole structure for that. Um, then now that elder can be taken out of, out of leadership and we can go about the process again. Right? So, it's amazing and beautiful how uh, how God has just given us this structure in order to keep the church in in a standing that's above reproach in the world, right? And what I think, unfortunately, we've seen a lot of is when we don't do that, when, when we make it about uh, a single person or uh, about you know this this culture mentality of this guy, he's our guy, right? Um, we can fall into a lot of traps because as soon as that guy falls then the whole ministry collapses because it wasn't built on scripture. It was built on personality. So next, uh, some of the questions that come forth was, is there an age qualification for an elder, right? So we don't have verses for an L, uh, age qualification for elder. However, the qualifications do seem to assume somebody that's more mature. Um, for example, they're not a recent convert. Um, they're able to teach well. They're not greedy. They have self-control. So th this is just a couple of them. But one of the things that I know that if you look at, if, if, you're, if you're older, right? So I'm in my mid-30s. If I look back, right, at myself, my ability to teach 10 years ago, uh, though I would have questioned it, like I would have been like, yo, I'm good. Like it was not at a position in which it was at par. Like I wasn't able to do that well. Um, greedy, right? Like a lot of... I, I'll just speak for myself. Like, I think a lot of younger people are like, yeah, let's make that money. Let's get that bag. I know I'm stepping outside of my, <laughs> my age range to use that sort of, that sort of vernacular, but, um, they're, they're, they want money. They want to be prosperous. They want to like, you know, get all that stuff, have all the nice things. And as you mature, you see that there are things more important than that. Like you want to be financially secure, but, uh, you don't need the best of the best all the time. You know that you can sacrifice and give that out. And that comes with maturity. Now, uh, same, same, same thing rather with self-control. Um, there's some things as a younger individual, you have to learn self-control, like not to just jump the gun, not to just jump in. Like you start seeing, you start weighing, okay, where is this a good move? Where is this not a good move? Um, and that comes with age as well. Now, there's obviously going to be uh, some people that are really young that are that are able to teach really well, that don't care about money, that are super self-controlled. But as a general rule, most aren't, right? When you're younger, there's some things you're still learning, even in your early 20s. So um, that's why, again, I think those qualifications, they don't, they don't, you know, disqualify a younger individual, but it's one of those things that we have to see, like, like we really have to test, how does this look? Because it's gonna be a temptation for people as far as self-control and greed and things like that. So we're not saying you have to, to be there right now as far as like, oh yeah, you're totally not greedy. But we have to see that, that trajectory, right? Like you don't care about money, you care about the kingdom. You don't, you don't just jump into situations, you actually weigh things out. Because again, you're not dealing with just your own name. You're dealing with the name of Christ and his name within the world and specifically the people that he's entrusted to you. So if you, if you have a trajectory where you can't teach well, or you, you kind of like that, that money, uh, or you, 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 or you're impulsive, right? So those things are the things that the reason the qualifications are, are there. So it doesn't disqualify a younger person, but you have to kind of tread carefully. The next thing that gets asked a lot is single men. Can single men be elders? And a lot of this comes from the fact that Paul in the qualifications say a husband of one wife. Now, through the text of a husband of one wife, we can assume that Paul isn't speaking uh, of only married men being qualified for eldership. If this were the case, uh, he would be excluded himself, though there are people that are, that uh, believe, and I think there's, there's some textual evidence that Paul might have been married and then widowed, but we won't get into that. Um, but he would disqualify himself, perhaps Jesus from eldership, possibly Titus and Timothy, because we're not sure about there's no indication that they had wives. 
Um, the idea here is that he can't mean that just because of what we see uh, in other places. Now, again, that's not a firm, fast argument, um, but there, it, it's one of those things where culturally speaking, when he's talking about a one husband wife, when we look at that culturally within the cultures of both Titus and Timothy of where they're at uh, and where they are told to, uh, to put elders in place, there wasn't a huge culture of polygamy. So it can almost be totally ruled out that he's not necessarily combating that. Okay. Though it could be the case that he's combating that a little bit more often than not, the commentaries and cultural uh, documents of the day seem to push forward this idea that uh, within those Roman cultures, uh, this idea of having concubines was okay. Like it wasn't looked bad upon. Uh, a man could have his wife and then uh, some concubines on the side. Um, and that was kind of just culturally norm. And Paul here, uh, a lot of the commentaries, historical uh, documents kind of point to the fact that Paul is naming out and calling out this idea of, hey, if you are going to be an elder in the church, you have to be a one woman man. You can't have a wife and a bunch of concubines on the side. You can't have, you know, <laughs> you can't have your main chick and your side chicks, right? So the idea here is Paul's pulling out this idea that, um, that you have to be solely focused on her and not have all of these other culturally acceptable yet biblically un, un um, yet biblically disqualifying situations here. You can't have that. You have to be this one woman man. Specifically, um, I think a lot of it comes back to the Ephesians 5 uh, picture that he paints uh, in other places in scripture in Ephesians 5 about, uh, you know, this, this, you are this living example of Christ in his church. And if you're this living example of Christ in his church, you can't be in a culture that, though it accepts having concubines, obviously demonstrates something that isn't congruent with the example that we're supposed to be living out. So single men, I don't think the one uh, husband of one wife excludes a single man because that's not really the point historically and culturally that Paul seems to be pushing here. He seems to be pushing this idea that you can't have your wife and a bunch of concubines because of, of even though it's culturally acceptable, it, it doesn't put forth this image of God and his covenant with his people and what that looks like. So, uh, uh, oh, sorry, one uh, additional thing here is that uh, the assumption seems to be here that if a man is married, he will be a one woman man living out what we see in Ephesians 5. Likewise, it can be assumed the same thing in regarding to obedient children. If the man does have children, they are expected to be obedient and faithful. Now, if you look at the words, um, uh, some people in, in Titus transform, uh, trans, uh, they, they, they uh, translate the word, uh, faithful as believer, which gives this indication that the children of this man have to be believers. Um, I personally don't hold to that, and this is why. If you look at the word, the word can translate as believer or faithful steward, uh, and that same word is used in a lot of places as far as faithfulness toward uh, toward the dealings in society, right? So it doesn't it doesn't have an exclusive or even lean toward this idea of believing in Christ as much as it does this idea of being faithful in their dealings with people. So they have to be obedient. They can't be known as like rambunctious people that just do not obey. Um, so the idea here is that the assumption that Paul is leading for is that these are men that are singly focused on their wives. They have children that listen, that obey, that they're teaching to live in proper ways. Uh, and the idea here is that, uh, that we see set forth like this example that Paul says, Hey, he has to be a good steward here because if he's not a good steward in his family, he's not going to be a good steward of the church. The idea being that the, a man that would be eldership material is going to be attentive to his family uh, because he needs to be attentive to the flock. He's going to be faithful to his wife because he needs to be faithful to Christ. He's going to have obedient children and be able to control them because he's going to have people that are in the church that are going to be very strong-willed, just like children are strong-willed. And he's going to be, have to demonstrate that he's able to control a situation as a leader because he's going to have to do that over here in the church as well. Um, many of the problems that Paul addresses in all of his letters are because people are unruly and uh, aren't uh, aren't listening. So the idea here doesn't seem to me, at least, to be that his children have to be Christians, because 
no one can control whether another person is a believer or not. Like we can lead people in the right direction, but I can't force you to be a believer any more than I can force my children to be believers. I can lay the gospel out in front of them like I can lay the gospel out in front of you, but it's an individual thing of becoming a believer. And we see that all through scripture. So the correlation that he's making between being over one's house in a, in a honorable way uh, correlates with what we need to see being honorable uh, in over the church. So uh, I just want to put that out there because I think that's important because there are some people that um, have been, they, they, they won't let them be pastors because their children aren't believers. Now to be careful in the distinction here, there are people that would be disqualified for eldership if their children are just incredibly rambunctious and causing trouble everywhere. Um, and again, the distinction comes when, well, you know, how old can that child be for that to count? Right? So, um, Children in this context, again, we have to go back to who, who's Paul writing to, what's his understanding of child. It would be someone in your household, okay? If, if, if my child is living with me, but yet they're going out and partying, getting drunk, causing all sorts of problems every weekend, and I can't control them, then I'm disqualified for eldership. Whereas if my child grows up, is obedient, uh, goes away, then just goes off and goes in a crazy direction because now they're outside the house. I don't have any control of them anymore. They're an adult. That's their decision that they're making totally outside of me. Even though I'm still calling them to Christ, they're not in my house anymore. That in that case doesn't seem to speak to disqualification because they've now went off and went on their own way and they're making their own decisions as an adult. So um, that would be the distinction that I would make there. Again, love to hear your feedback, but I think the, the scripture here supports that a bit. Uh, does this mean that a single elder now married with kids would be taken out, could be taken out of eldership for disobedient children uh, or in the condition, uh, connection of being unfaithful? And I would say yes. Uh, if you go into eldership as a single man and then during the time that you're an elder, you get married and you have kids, um, those qualifications now fall upon you uh, because of just your status in life. So there's that. So a divorce man, this was another question that comes up a lot. And I think this, again, just like a lot of these things we're looking at is going to vary based upon your denomination. But what we're looking at is scripture here, right? What does scripture say about it? Can a man that has been divorced be an elder? Uh, in instances of divorce, the current elders that are bringing this person into eldership uh, would need to look at the reasons for the divorce. So for example, adultery, etc. what took place? And in this situation, uh, just looking at it, he might be excluded from eldership based on things connected to that divorce. So, for example, the qualification of well thought outside or well thought of outside the church, um, because there's going to be people that knew about this divorce. So they're going to be able to speak to how did he handle himself? Was he responsible for it? Like, obviously, you don't go to them for the final say. But those are the things that when we're looking at qualifications, they have to be well thought of outside of the church community. They have to be well thought of within just the community in, at large. So that might play into that. Now, again, I think this comes down to we have a serious misunderstanding within the church about how serious God takes marriage and how serious God takes uh, divorce. I do not have time <laughs> in this video to cover all of that. There's going to be a, a video uh, from Mike Winger down in the description. I think the video is three hours long. And then there's another video that's two hours long, I believe, that's a follow up to the first one. So you got five hours there. I have not been able to find a more accessible, and what I mean by that is that's free. So you don't have to buy a book. You don't have to do any of that. You can just watch the video. I've not found a more accessible version of explana uh, explaining biblical divorce than Mike Winger's video on divorce. I would highly encourage you to go look at that because there is biblical divorce and there is non-biblical divorce. And that plays a lot into can a divorced man be an elder? Because was it a biblical divorce or was it not a biblical divorce? Now, does this mean once a man has been divorced, whether it be before conversion or after, that he is disqualified from being an elder? Now, I, I, again, I would encourage you to go watch that Mike Winger video. But in general, uh, within the, the general understanding of the tradition of the church, the idea has simply been that it would seem to be an extremely rare occurrence, like extremely rare occurrence for a man who has been divorced, whether it be biblically allowed or not, to fulfill the role of elder in the local church. Now, hold on to any like uh, maybe anger or disagreement you have to that because we're going to address this along with the women elders here in a moment at the end. 
So women, can women be elders in the church? Uh, now, a couple things before we get into this. I think this is probably the most heated of this whole process. So I can say, hey, here are the qualifications. And people might have a little bit of an issue with that. But uh, by and large, Scripture is really clear about the, uh, the qualifications. So it's either you submit to Scripture or you don't. But when it comes to the discussion of women in eldership, it's a lot more of a convoluted topic than some would make it out to be. Some people would just say, hey, that's what it says there and that's why we do it. Uh, and then others would say, well, there's other stuff and we need to look at that as well. So let's let's get into that a little bit. We need to approach it, though, with a lot of a lot of charity for one another. Uh, this topic is often not done justice because there's strawman arguments from both sides. Right. So the strawman argument is the complementarians are patriarchal pigs that just want to keep women out of leadership and want them pregnant and in the kitchen. And then the egalitarians uh, are just Christian feminists that let anything go and make no distinctions between genders at all. Now, it's important that though we do know probably each of us of like a stereotypical one or the other, that's the exception to the rule. Uh, in general, by and large, that is not, uh, those are not the positions held by either complementarians or egalitarians. But what we do a lot of times is take the worst of what we see and be like, okay, well, that's going to define that for me. So you've seen a complementarian that just refuses to let a woman do anything, and you go, well, that's complementarianism. Or you've seen an egalitarian that literally just makes no distinction between male and female gender at all, and then you go, well, that's an egalitarian. And it's just not, it's not fair uh, to approach it that way. So women in eldership. Uh, the general arguments uh, for women in eldership are examples of leaders that we see within the Bible, right? So Deborah, Myra, Mary, Lydia, Philip's daughters, Phoebe, uh, and then the situation with Apollos uh, when we see Priscilla and Aquila. Now, uh, another argument and a big one, especially for the Timothy passage, is the culture at Ephesus at the time when Paul writes that a woman should not usurp authority over a man, right? Uh, the, the Temple of Artemis and that entire cultural argument is brought up. Uh, on that passage every single time, right? So that's one of the things as well. And then lastly, and I'd say probably uh, one of the bigger arguments outside of the Temple of Artemis is the Jesus, Jesus specific interaction with women, allowing Mary to sit at his feet while he teaches, um, those sorts of things that are culturally uh, way outside of what the culture would have accepted at the time. I think uh, when we look at the culture and understand that in that culture, in Jesus' day and Paul's day, uh, in the early church, uh, just in general, that women were not looked at highly as far as having value or worth or able to even take care of themselves. Um, like when we look at the Gospels and the early church, we see that women are really brought up to this this high level of uh, like you can like just this acknowledgement that they have value and they are created in the image of God. And these are the arguments that are often used. Um, now, one of the things I want to say before we move too much on. Uh, a couple things. One, there's a lot of material, uh, both pro and con, in the description section for women in ministry. And I would encourage you to go look at all of it. Uh, some of it, I find the arguments not so, not very well, not very well composed. Uh, some of them are really well done, uh, but there's, there's a lot down there. So I would encourage you to go look at that because again, just like the subject of eldership, when you get into this enormous topic, uh, there's big topics within this topic. Uh, and this is one of those bigger topics. So with the Temple of Artemis argument, I would say uh, just out front so you know where I'm at, I'm a complementarian. So uh, I think that the only position within the church that would be shut off from a woman would be eldership. Uh, but the idea here is I think the, the Temple of Artemis argument is, 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 is a really good cultural contextual argument. I just think two things can be true at the same time. Uh, what I mean by that is I think Paul, I think there's sufficient evidence that if we're going to be honest as far as hermeneutics and exegetical work, there's sufficient evidence there that Paul, when he's talking about women usurping authority over a man, um, it probably is talking about the Artemis cult and what's happening there, even though he doesn't name it. Because, again, he could have just named it. That would have made things so much easier. Uh, but he didn't. So now we have to guess. Uh, but I think exegetically, if we look at that, it, there's a pretty strong argument for that's probably what he was addressing. Now, what I mean by two things can be true at the same time, when we look at other places, so Titus, and when we look at Peter, and we look at just the early church being set up, uh, it's pretty obvious that Paul, when he's setting up eldership within the church, 
is doing so based on the model, the Jewish model that he knew as far as elders are only men. Elders, uh, 10 or more elders, you know, can, when brought together, uh, they can start a synagogue. So he's borrowing from what he knows in order to set up the early church of, that, he, that, is, that is growing exponentially at the time. So I, I, I have found it very hard to find any commentary that would disagree that Paul, when he's speaking of eldership, is specifically speaking, uh, he, he is specifically speaking, rather, of men elders. Um, now, there's obviously argument about, you know, was his intent to eventually, you know, have women elders? There, there, there could be that argument being said. But I think you'd be hard pressed to find anything that would say that he that his intent was anything other than male eldership just because of how he words it uh, and other places. Now, again, that being said, I think two things could be true at the same time. The Artemis cult um, argument as far as for Timothy makes sense. Uh, but we have to look at all the other places in the scripture as well and say, well, OK, what was the intent of meaning here? And it seems to be that he was setting up male eldership. Um, so all that to say, and I'll address this at the very end here, that does not negate the fact that the, the, the early church, the New Testament, right, speaks of this amazing value and worth totally outside of the cultural context of the value of women in ministry as far as proclaiming the gospel, right? So lots of the arguments about women in ministry are that at the tomb, the women are the ones that brought the message to the men. And that would have been just amazing because they couldn't even testify in court. Like, so I totally agree with those arguments. The, the idea here that, that the early church embraced this idea that women had a voice, that they could know theology, that they could know God, that they could, they could tell others. Like that is an amazing truth of the gospel. But I would hold, just looking at scripture here, that two things can be true at the same time. So that being said, I'm sure there's plenty of people that disagree with me on that. But that's kind of my thinking process in a really condensed nutshell there. So uh, we have to address the other roles that we see and offices that we see in scripture, right? So deacons is the other uh, very obvious role that we see within the early church. Uh, the biblical role of deacon is to take care of the physical and logistical needs of the church so that the elders can concentrate primarily on their calling of teaching uh, and ministering. So we see this first in Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 6. We see this because of uh, the feeding of, of, of um, the early church as far as it wasn't dispersed well. So they appoint these deacons to do those uh, do that thing. Stephen was one of those deacons. Uh, this is a crucial role, and I think something that's very undervalued within the church. Because most of the time, if you go to a church structure, what you see is the pastor and the congregation, right? Or the pastors and the congregation. There's no in-between there. Now, some churches, though they call the person pastor, they would actually more fit into the role of deacon. And I think this is where the... Uh, the language gets muddied a bit in modern times because you have, for example, uh, pastoral care, right? Pastors that are specifically for pastoral care, which I would argue fit into the deacon role because that's what they're doing. They're dealing with the, ph the physical needs of the congregation. You have people that are, for example, the administration, administrative pastor, uh, which I would argue also fits into this deacon role because it's the logistical, the financial part of things. Uh, I think a lot of times the reason modern churches put that pastor uh, title beside whatever is so that they can pay them <laughs> and justify it. Um, I mean, that's just, just to be frank with you, I think that's why. Um, we, we are really bad within the church right now with saying, hey, there's certain things that, you know, there's roles that you should do as a volunteer. And there should roles should that should be done that should be paid. And we'll get into that a little bit here in a second. But I think honestly, that's the justification. If I had an executive pastor that deals with all of the logistical operations of the church, uh, we put pastor beside it because we go, okay, well, they're getting paid for that. And that's just sort of an identifier for us. And we've really lost what we see here in scripture as far as elders qualified versus deacons and kind of what that looks like. So um, it's a critical role though, very critical role because it allows the pastors to be free to do the things they need to do. So you may know a pastor, for example, that, uh, if they're pastoring by themselves, uh, some of the, sometimes you can tell when they've had a really busy week with the congregation because their sermon isn't as good. You can tell they haven't put as much prep and time into it. Uh, and almost always when you look into it, you can find that that week they had to visit a lot more. They had a lot more funerals. They maybe they married a lot of people. Maybe they had a lot of counseling with people that week. And because of all that time, it took away from their prep 
uh, for their teaching preaching and that suffered because of that. So I, because we don't see the roles very well, other things suffer. Whereas if we were to see that there's elders and there's deacons and the job descriptions that we see laid forth in scripture, if we do those well, they work really, really well together. So uh, the qualifications for deacon, it's such an important position that the qualifications for deacon are almost identical to those of the elder. The only difference really that we see is between uh, the, there's the callings and the gifts and the characters of the individual. So the deacons have uh, the, the characteristics that we see within the qualifications, but they don't have the calling part as far as the teaching, uh, the preaching, the, uh, the carrying over the flock sort of uh, as far as the defending part of it. Um, we, we, we don't see those kind of characteristics within, uh, within that. Now, there is one thing that somebody wanted to talk me to talk about, but be, to be quite frank with you, it'll have to be a whole different video because it's a lot more research that needs to be put into it outside of this discussion of elder. And it's on the fivefold ministry that a lot of people talk about. Now, if you're in the charismatic Pentecostal movement, you are really familiar with the fivefold ministry and what that looks like. If you're not, you may not be familiar with it because... Uh, it's very prominent within the Pentecostal charismatic movement and not so prominent other places. But my hope is that at some point um, I can do a video resource just on that, but there's just not, honestly, I was going to try to cover it, but when I got into it, it was just so much that there was no way I had time to do it. So anyway, uh, here's the overall important points that I think we have to understand in order when we're looking at this topic. Um, Churches should not only raise up elders, but invest time and training in equipping those elders. Lots of times we assume that if somebody meets those qualifications, then they're good to go, pat them on the back, go into ministry, you're, you're all set. But um, oftentimes people are put in that position and then just assume that they don't need anything else, right? Uh, in the description, there's actually a YouTube channel that I want to link that uh, it's, it's a great resource for training up elders, right? Uh, for further training as far as biblical truths, things that they should read, things that they should be involved in to really uh, not only bring out their giftedness more than it's already evident, uh, but to really uh, to hone that in to just really make them the best elder that they can be. So that's, that's also down there. Um, an important thing to remember is that an elder that's invested in is going to be an elder that invests in others to bring elders up. When we don't understand that as uh, an elder in the church, a leader in, the, in Christ's church is to be preaching, teaching, caring for the sheep, but is also supposed to be a good example uh, to other men in the church that might come along behind them and become an elder. Oftentimes, and so often what I've seen is uh, seemingly really strong, good biblical churches will uh, have really a, a good elder or usually just one pastor, but because it's not done in a plurality of elders, he doesn't have time or doesn't make the time to invest in younger leaders so that when he knows his time is up and he needs to you know, move on, retire, whatever, there's somebody right behind him to take that place, that that momentum is already built up. And so the transition between the two is great. And I'm just telling you, I don't know if you've ever seen a, a good transition between pastors, but it's a it, it is a, a beautiful thing to see that there's there's no infighting, there's no problems. The church already was aware that this this man was being raised up in order to take that position. Like there's just this this knowledge that the congregation already knows and loves this man before he even takes the position of elder because the pastors uh, are are bringing bringing that that person up. So anyway, just uh, an idea there. Also uh, in a non eldership role that's specifically teaching preaching uh it's the same the same thing within those churches that if there's a transition out between elders uh, again that's already known so for example if an elder's really good at finances that's just what they're really really good at um or if a deacon for that matter is really good at finances those transitions you need to be able to be raising people up behind you to take those positions over so the church doesn't have to be worried about it okay the church is if they, they know the pastor is moving on, the church doesn't have to be worried about the transition because that pastor is already working on bringing up another pastor. Same thing with finances. If, if the finances, like we want the church to know that we love and care for you. And because of that, we love and care for your finances and we're doing due diligence to protect them. Then, you know, that, that person being brought in that role is trustworthy and good and fits the qualifications as well. So not to be the dead horse, but 
You want to invest in your elders. Uh, and here's the important thing uh, when we're talking about divorced uh, men that might not qualify, uh, women that might not qualify for eldership, like service to the church isn't attached to a title. Okay. Um, within the church, we see that there are two distinctive things that, that is set up uh, wherever churches are set up, which is elders and deacons. Now, elders and deacons fit certain qualifications, and there's a reason they fit those certain qualifications, but that doesn't mean they're the only people that serve in the church. I think oftentimes people get mad that they can't be in the position of deacon or they can't be in the position of elder because they don't meet the qualifications, so they just get angry that they're not allowed those titles. And we forget that um, throughout time, service to the church isn't tied to a title. Like we as believers are the body of Christ serving one another and being there for one another, going and living out our, our changed lives in the community. So the idea that that has to be attached to a title somehow to, to, to make us feel better about that or to, to make us think that that's the only way that we can, you know, have worth is, is a very extra biblical idea. We're to serve in the church. And as we serve in the church, uh, the elders see that service and say, hey, look at those qualities that they're already, they're already existing in this person's life. Maybe we can bring them into a deaconship role or maybe we can bring them into an eldership role. This isn't a, hey, applying for the job and hoping you get it. This is a, I'm already living these things out. These qualities are already apparent in my life. So now as an elder, I'm able to look and say, hey, that person, we definitely want to, we want to talk to that person. And even if you never get talked to, why do you serve, right? That's the question. Do I serve so one day I can be a deacon or elder? No, no, I don't do that. I serve because I'm a Christian. In fact, in this study, which I won't touch on it, I don't think I touched on it at all in this, in this presentation, but uh, we're, we're warned that, you know, not many of you should be teachers because you'll be judged more harshly. It should actually be a situation when you're asked to be an elder, you go, hold on, <laughs> That like uh, that that's that's a that's a high calling. That's a high role. Like I'm going to be held more accountable by God because of that. Um, when pastors get up to preach, or when pastor elders get up to do whatever they do in the name and service of Christ, uh, we should keep that in mind. That what we're doing, uh, we are going to be judged uh, more strictly for because of the position that we hold within the church. So it isn't a hey, let me in. It's a when you're asked, you go you really check yourself. Is this something that I, that I'm qualified for? You think I am, but am I like you go, I don't know if I am like the humbleness right there automatically tells me if you would be a good fit for an elder or deacon. If you come knocking on the door, I go, okay, well let's look at the qualifications. But if you're pushing that door down to get in, that automatically tells me that you're not suited for the position. So we serve in the church because we serve Christ, not we don't serve for a title, and it's not attached to that. One's ability to serve Christ Church is a mandate for all believers, not just people that are titled that way. The disqualification for elder doesn't devalue one's walk in Christ, and there are many other places to be of service in the body outside of those positions. It should actually encourage us as, as believers uh, that there is such a high standard for eldership in Christ Church, because that means that we can trust without even having to worry about it, that these leaders are going to do what they're supposed to do. This allows Christ Church to be above reproach as much as it has to do with us in the world's eyes, right? So the world is not, there's going to be things the world just disagrees with on the church because of biblical stances. But in as much as we can do what we can do to make it uh, to where it's difficult for them to hate us, we should do that. Uh, we shouldn't have the world being able to say, hey, you have pastors that commit adultery or, hey, you have pastors that steal or you have pastors that, you know, have an absolutely horrible mouth. Right. So there should be things that that we we hold ourselves to because of the qualifications that make it difficult for the world to to hate us. So. Uh, churches and eldership structure, right? So here we are to the nitty gritty part of it, of trying to identify where your church falls into this structure. There are three main church structures that we have. Um, the first is Episcopal, which is like a hierarchy structure with decisions made 
from the top down. So think, you know, for example, uh, the Catholic Church, the Methodist Church, the Episcopal Church, uh, where it gets its name from. Leaders from outside of the church appoint pastors, move pastors. Uh, typically, they own the church buildings, the lands, uh, and they, they come into the church to help with church discipline when needed. Um, and like I said before, Methodist, Episcopal, Catholic churches, with the exception of a couple there, uh, again, you're going to find some outliers, but by and large, those are the, the church structures that they use. Uh, there's a Presbyterian church structure, which the decisions are made by a working together of multiple elders with the congregation's input. So at the end of the day, the elders are the ones that make the decisions, but they have congregational input based upon uh, what those decisions are, right? So they bring it before the congregation and then they vote based upon what they feel is best as well as with the congregational input. Qualified elders in this in this type of church structure uh, make decisions with input for the congregation on receiving new elders, financial decisions, building projects, church discipline, those sorts of things. The important thing to remember about this structure is that everything is basically done in-house um, with the exceptions of a couple, right? So uh, Presbyterians, some non-dominational churches, uh, church plants operate in this manner. Uh, Southern Baptist Church would kind of fit in this structure, whereas they're a part of a so an association, but that association has a very, if not a non-existent actual hold on specific churches. So they're associated together, though they operate independently, if that makes sense. Uh, congregational model. Everything is made, uh, every decision is made by the congregation, right? Um, there is nothing outside of the church that has influence on the congregation. In fact, in the congregational model, by and large, the, the pastor doesn't even have a say uh, on what happens. The congregation is made up of a board of people um, or a whole congregation. It kind of depends on the congregational structure. It varies. Um, some congregation congregational structures, the whole congregation would vote, for example, to bring in a new pastor big financial decisions, those sorts of things. Uh, but like a lot of, in the congregational model, a lot of the smaller decisions are made by an elected board of people um, uh, or board of elders that would that would make those decisions for them. Uh, some denomination churches would also fit into this. It all really depends on kind of what church planning, non-denominational network you're part of. Uh, Wesleyan churches by and large operate with this way, though they do kind of have a little bit of a hierarchical structure outside, but it's it's very congregational in nature. And then the Church of Christ denomination operates like this as well. So um, which of these is most biblical? Now, I'm going to say this because depending on what uh, denomination or tradition you come from, you're probably going to hold that your denomination has it right um, or you'll lean that way. The idea of this section isn't to say, hey, who's right, who's wrong, because I think we can hold this really loosely as long as we're following like biblical uh, structure. Now, I would say by and large, uh, the the Episcopal structure, I don't see that really within scripture outside of the idea that the church in Jerusalem, uh, they sent a lot of money to that and they kind of, you know, divvied that out. So I, you can see bits and pieces of it. But they didn't have a, a large hold on individual churches throughout the early church. So that, again, arguments can be made either way. So just know that this isn't a hard and fast rule. This is more just for giving you scripture for you to look into for yourselves, right? So each church structure would, <laughs> would should claim that Jesus is the head of the church. If you don't, then you're already outside of orthodoxy and you're in trouble. Uh, here's some verses to kind of just back that up scripturally that Jesus is the head of the church. And if you're outside of that idea, like, so for example, if your pastor is above Jesus, um, that's a problem. Some people, uh, and I, I would lean this way as well, would say that the idea that the, the Pope within the Catholic church can change doctrine, uh, that is troubling for me to say the least, because that to me says that he's putting himself above the, what, what God has already said. Though Catholics would argue that that's not what he's doing. So again, charity where we can give charity there, because I'm sure that that'll be an argument from some people. Um, looking at the early church, though, we see verses that help us understand the structure, and that's, it's very helpful. Jer verses, for example, on pastor and overseers, there they are there. You can pause the screen if you need to look those up or write those down. Uh, we also have uh, verses on actions that were done in the early church uh, as far as how they operated uh, what they did, 
uh, how they took care of each other, how uh, doctrine was passed down. Those sorts of things are incredibly important and should be looked into as far as local church operations. And the verses for there are there as well. We can't go through all of them, but um, they give us a good structure of how the local body operates in and of itself um, under the eldership. So the argument for plurality of elders in the church is in, in the early church specifically is incredibly strong. Uh, we see uh, them in each church, uh, any church that they go to set up, uh, there's always appointing elders within the church. It's always more than one. It's not a single pastor and it's always a number of them, though. Obviously this, um, obviously the number, there's no set number because that's going to depend on the need of the church, the size of the church, what uh, the church is lacking. So um, it's one of those things where there's not like an X amount of elders you're supposed to have. Though, again, going back to the argument that how Paul set up uh, eldership was very likely based on his understanding of, uh, you know, synagogue eldership and how leadership should work. Um, but the idea here is, again, that argument's not like incredibly strong, though I think it's very well supported. But the idea is here that he, you know, it could have been 10, it could have been less, because uh, Paul's fairly liberal in his uh, taking from his Jewish tradition and transferring it into uh, his following of Christ, where he takes the core structures, it seems like, uh, but loosens the, um, the the kind of the added things uh, that were added by, um, you know, the Jewish people throughout history. So take that for what it's worth. That's That's what I saw in my, you know, study of this. So um, there's that examples, uh, can be found, for example, of multiple elders in a church in, uh, Philippians, Peter, Acts, uh, James, Titus, all of these are great examples. Again, I would highly recommend you just take a screenshot of this screen and then you can look those up for yourselves. So, uh, one of the things that comes up a lot, uh, that didn't really fit well into any other part of this, this kind of this video was compensation pay for pastors. Because for some reason, and I've never been in a church where this is an issue, but in some churches, it's apparently an issue as far as paying for pastors. Uh, compensation for those in the position of eldership is vary by church structure, right? As far as how much they get paid, if they get paid, what positions get paid. Uh, some of them are set up very corporately. When I was looking at this, uh, the same churches, for example, that don't talk about eldership, but talk about leadership are very apt to pay on a co corporate structure pay kind of grade, right? So you'll know who gets paid more because executive is beside their name. You know who gets paid a little bit less because pastor is beside their name. Underneath them, there's assistants. And it's a very corporate sort of structure, which we don't see within the New Testament at all. Um, but the idea here is that it's important to uh, contrast paying pastors with the qualifications we also see lead forth for one that desires to be a pastor or an elder. The idea is that that person is not greedy for gain. They're not after the money. So th this comes down to the fact that it's not about getting paid. Uh, the general rule and uh, one of the videos in the description actually talks about the idea that the pastor should probably just for um, just for the, the sake of Christ church be paid at the uh, at a comparable level to the people that he has with inside his church. So, for example, if everybody in the church is driving a you know a beat up car, the church the pastor can't expect if he gets paid at all to get paid a ton of money to where he can drive like a brand new one if everyone else is driving a junk car. Uh, in the same regards, if if everybody in the church is fairly well off, you shouldn't deprive your pastor of pay uh, just because he's a pastor, right? It should be this idea that you are giving generously out of your heart because of what that pastor is doing. Uh, for the body of Christ. So you have to contrast those between the greed, um, but obviously if the pastor is already an elder, the greed part shouldn't be an issue. But obviously a pastor should, uh, oh, sorry, I put should demand. It shouldn't, should not demand payment. However, the congregation uh, does give out of gratitude. I, I thought I corrected all my errors in this PowerPoint. Apparently I didn't. Uh, so sometimes such as uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter nine, pastors will refuse to take pay based on a number of different convictions or reasons that they see would hinder the gospel. I would highly um, recommend you go read 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Paul lays out a really good argument for why he would deserve compensation for it, but why he doesn't take compensation for it. Uh, there have been some places that I know of where pastors uh, work a full job outside of the church, so the church doesn't have to pay them because the church is in a really bad spot as far as how there's a lot of sin in the church, there's a lot of error in the church based on poor eldership beforehand. And that pastor does not want his 
his livelihood and his family, uh, his family's livelihood to be based on a church that if he, for example, talks about sin, they, they fire him. Right. So he, he, he's, uh, and the couple examples I can think of, they've went into these churches with the idea of, look, I'm going to tell you some very uncomfortable truths, but I do not want my payment to be, I don't want to be paid for it because there's going to be things that are going to upset people. And I'm not going to put my family in the position in which my kids can't eat because you're mad that I told you that you're a sinner. Okay. So they'll work a full-time job outside of that to provide for their family. And then when the church gets balanced and in a right place, uh, biblically, then they'll take on, uh, they'll take on that compensation because the church is now healthy and they don't have to worry about, um, you know, the church withholding funds because they called out sin. Okay. Um, so anyway, that's, that's one of the things, but, uh, what we do see being laid out, uh, for compensation, uh, we do see that in scripture, for example, first Timothy chapter five, verse 17, uh, which does seem to, uh, draw out, uh, uh, an honor and a more of a co compensation for a teaching, uh, teaching, preaching elder or pastor, right? This idea that they're the one that is devoting a ton of time into scripture and for pastoral care. And because of that, um, we need to be able to give them the right amount of time to do that. Again, going back to the, the example I gave before, there's some pastors that um, they're bilocational, they're expected to preach, they're expected to uh, visit, they're expected to do weddings, they're expected to do funerals, all of these things. And um, there's just not enough time for them to do all of that and have another job. So uh, what we seem to see here uh, within scripture is that if you expect a high level of teaching from your pastor, if you want them to be able to communicate the word of God in a right way, they need to have the time to do the study that they ought to do to be able to give you that sort of care. Um, not only in the pastoral sense, but also just in the care sense of you can't expect a pastor to work a full-time job and do every funeral and every visit because there are other things that are attached to. So that being said, just first Timothy seems to allude to, you know, the general situation of that. Uh, we also see Paul making a case for churches to support their teachers materially, whether it be food, money, uh, good things that come from that uh, in Galatians chapter six, verse six. And then just in general, we see a historical pattern of taking care of those who take care of God's people. Uh, we see it in, in the Old Testament, in Numbers and Deuteronomy with the Levitical priesthood. Uh, we see this in, uh, in the New Testament, for example, Jesus' words in Matthew, as well as 1 Corinthians, uh, uh, part of that big discourse I told you to read in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. The idea here is that uh, if I'm a pastor or an elder coming and saying, hey, I deserve this, 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 and this, uh, automatically um, that should be disqualifying unless it's just simply asking for, hey, I need enough to take care of my family, right? This isn't, a, I'm going to buy a brand new mansion and take care of my family. It's saying, look, I mean, within the area, the, the standard median income is X. So you should at least pay them X so that they can live in such a way that they can uh, be available to the congregation. A pastor should not have to be uh, expected to take care of a lot of the duties of pastoring while also working three jobs on the side to provide for his family, if that makes sense. So you want to take care of those that take care of God's house. And that's laid forth in scripture, right? Uh, now, not every pastoral elder position will be paid. Many pastoral positions that are within a plurality of elder context are unpaid elder positions, right? Uh, the idea is that there might be some compensation on the side for the duties that they do perform. But by and large, these are elders that aren't in it for the money. They're in it because they're called to be elders. They want to help Christ church. They want to give their gifts uh, in such a way that they can minister to the body and shepherd the flock well. Um, so many times I know within at least uh, half a dozen churches that I know that have plurality of elders, usually uh, there's two paid staff pastors uh, and then three other unpaid elder pastors that, that help where needed uh, and do what they need to do with little or no compensation because they're not there for that. But they do pay a couple pastors in order to take care of the more uh, strenuous parts of pastoring the local church. And they do that so that they don't have to worry about the pastors being available. If somebody needs a funeral, we have a guy for that. Uh, if somebody needs a wedding, we have a guy for that. Uh, if we need to, you know, if somebody needs to fill in because the lead pastor's sick, they can do that. Why? Well, we have elders that are qualified to teach, right? So they can step in when they need to step in. Um, that's the idea. 
So what does all this mean? What is this big long video being led up to? Well, hopefully you see that biblical eldership is necessary for uh, uh, the health and growth of the local church. You are not going to have a healthy growing church outside of, uh, of el good eldership. Now, let me make some qualifiers. I said healthy and growing. You may have a church that is growing exponentially uh, based on a number of other factors that will help churches grow. But long term, the health of the church uh, will it be, and by health, I don't just mean operating well, I mean a biblically based uh, people growing in the goodness of God, volunteering their time, not for themselves, but for the glory of the kingdom, more people being added to the kingdom uh, because of people that have been uh, just scripturally saturated, right? So to have a healthy, growing church, um, eldership, biblical eldership is necessary because um, if not, you're just not going to have it. The biblical qualifications for elder must be upheld for this to occur. Uh, though we may have ideas on how to run a local church based on our traditions and dominations, we must submit those ideas to scriptures first, right? So if there's something that's happening in the local church that doesn't seem like it's quite biblical, then we need to say, okay, what are we doing here that might not be right? And I'm not going to be able to answer those questions for you. I know uh, I'll give you a couple kind of scenarios that have come up uh, with people that have asked this question. So for the one of the most one, just based on this account, uh, because of the account name is, are youth pastors a biblical model for how we're supposed to do church? Uh, I would say by and large, that's a big old no, right? By and large, youth ministry has been seen as the, the youth version of big church. So the youth pastor is the main pastor to the youth, whereas the, you know, the big church pastor is the pastor to the main church. That is not a biblical model that we see at all within scripture. The idea is that the parents are the ones that uh, disciple the children. Uh, if we look back in the history of youth ministry, and that's not what this video is about, but just a real quick thing, children's ministry and youth ministry were specifically uh, made in order to uh, minister to the children within society that did not have uh, parents. So uh, those that were orphans or runaways or didn't have an education, children's ministry, Sunday school, that whole kind of uh, side of ministry was specifically developed for the care of those that did not have uh, did not have parents that were pouring into them in a biblical manner. So if, if you're using youth ministry as a way to pour into those that don't have biblical parents and to care for those that are orphans and uh, that don't have you know, the, the, the things in place, the marginalized, like if that's what you're using youth ministry for, to, to reach marginalized children, I mean, we, I think we have a fairly good idea of that that would be the, the, the right direction to take this. Um, should the youth pastor be an elder in the church? Is he teaching people? Um, that's where you have to start asking those questions, right? Is this a is this a teaching preaching role, or is this a ministry on the side in order to care for youth, uh, but also incorporate them into the larger church body in which qualified adults are going to be able to, you know, adopt quote unquote, like not actually legally adopt, but to become the kind of the the father, the mother, the parental figures of these children as they grow in the body, right? So you have to decide that that has to be, uh, my point is you need to challenge the ideas of what typical ministry has looked like for you, right? What that looks like. So I would say if a church is using youth ministry specifically to minister, to teach youth that have parents that go to that church, but aren't expecting those parents to disciple their own children, that is a broken model of what we see biblically, but that's just me. And I know there's people that disagree with me. So um, same thing with worship pastors, uh, worship leaders, right? We don't see that really typically within scripture. Uh, I mean, we have people that like that, that lead off the people in song. But as far as that title, that pastor should worship leaders, worship pastors specifically, be elders in the church. Well, what is singing doing, right? Is it teaching? Is singing uh, teaching the same thing or do they have a, a position within the elder board or are they a deacon or are they a volunteer? Like what do those things look like and how you compensate those people? That's going to be based upon that church structure and how you can work that out biblically, right? So um, again, I don't think there's necessarily a hard and fast answer, but those are the things you have to, when you're thinking of titles, right? Um, and what those titles mean, we have to think biblically about those titles. So 
um, that's just something to, 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 to knock around in your head for ever in a day. Try to decide for yourself. Uh, so all believers have a place in the local church according to their giftedness. Uh, <clears throat> the <clears throat> perceived exclusion of some in the office of elder isn't a hindrance, but rather a help to ensure Christ's church is held to a higher standard. Uh, this idea that, um, you know, elders or deacons are a higher Christian, like varsity level is not true. Uh, we should all as Christians uh, move toward and try to meet the qualifications that we see put forth within the broader form of what qualifications for eldership should be. Because many of those qualifications, as I've already mentioned, are qualifications that every Christian should have, right? We should be above reproach. We should be, uh, the community should think well of us. Um, there's all these sorts of things that we should already meet naturally, but there are certain ones that, as we've already talked about, that are specific for eldership. It does not make elders or deacons super Christians. It just means that there's a standard there that we have for people that lead Christ's church so that they can lead it well. The church as a whole is above reproach within the wider society, which enables us to minister as believers uh, more efficiently because we're taught well, we're fed well, we're taken care of, and now we can go out and do the same in the name of Jesus. Amen. So uh, hopefully this has been helpful to you. Uh, again, there is, I'm sure there's things that you heard about during this presentation that maybe, um, you, you've never heard about before and never crossed your mind. That's why I'm including everything that I looked at. Uh, I think it's everything. I hope I took really good notes, but everything should be down in the description, uh, under certain, you know, titles and organized so you can look at it as clearly as possible so that you can look into these things yourself, because it's incredibly important. I would say it's it's detrimental to the church if we don't understand this topic well, because if we if we let anybody and everybody into an eldership leadership position within the church, it can it can be devastating, and we don't want that. Uh, we've seen a lot of people walk away from the faith because of horrible horrible elders that should have never been there in the first place. Uh, but I, you know, on the other side of the same coin, I've seen some people grow so deep in their relationship with Jesus and become great elders themselves because they've had great elders. So let's look deep into this topic uh, and, you know, just really pray for those that are in eldership. They would be faithful to the mission of Christ and protecting his church. Guys, thank you for watching, following, subscribing. Hopefully this was helpful to you. If it was, please give it a thumbs up. Share it with some other people. Uh, I, 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 my hope for this is that it, it will help people think about and think through this process. So, guys, thank you for following, subscribing. Have a wonderful day.